Hey guys, Sinatra Progressive. Okay, we're almost on time. So today I have a really good panel. I have uh, I have Will. He is a philolithic attorney and a poet. And I have Zen back from yesterday. So we are going to have a really, really great discussion. Uh, so first, I would really like, uh, Will, will you please describe what you do what is a biolithic attorney and what do you specialize in yeah so i, I call myself a uh, biophilic writer and biophilic attorney. sorry <laughs> oh, i got it wrong biophilic That's okay it's <laughs> it's it is it is literal greek so it, it's um not a, a natural word for english english speaking mouths i guess um but biophilia uh literally means lover of life and I use that term to, uh, to differentiate myself from, from maybe anthropocentric uh, lawyers or writers or other kinds of, of activists. Um, and I, for me, um, we have to start with the natural world. Any, any, all of our work, uh, anything that we do is only made possible because of the natural world. So if we don't have clean water to drink or clean air to breathe um, or arable soil uh, to support our food, then um, anything we're doing doesn't really mean anything. And I think that's exactly why I wanted you on today was exactly that sentiment because people are not focusing on ecology, they're focusing on economy. And, and it's really important to me to try and get it through people's heads that we need to focus more on ecology and, and the fact that we are ourselves animals that depend on other living beings to exist ourselves, And that's just not a focus in our society today. So before we go on, I want uh, Zen to go ahead. Zen, just to give people uh, a little I, I know there's been com some confusion. People thought you were a scientist. You're not a scientist. This is your hobby. You've just been researching this for like a decade. So I would really like you to, to tell people about you just a little bit. Well, my training experience and skill set is actually in troubleshooting, problem solving. As a hobby for the last decade, I focused on working with developing a better understanding in the mechanisms behind closed loop ecosystems and understanding homeostatic equilibrium. So how relationships between symbio uh, symbiotic relationships between paired species in complex ecosystems functions. And, um, and everything that Will said, I, I'm absolutely a lover of, of biology and life as well and recognize how important it is. That's awesome. Okay, so really the conversation I wanted to get into tonight uh, was pretty much, okay, this is kind of the thing I've been on for the last couple of weeks. What is missing from from people's uh, thoughts and, and plans with, with something like the Green New Deal? They're, they're really focusing on, on basing it on something like the, the New Deal, which was really devastating to the ecosystem. It may have been great for the economy, but it wasn't really great for the ecosystem, building all those dams and bridges and roads. And, and so I, what I really want to get a feel for is your guys' opinion on what we can do better. If, if you were to reinvent something like the Green New Deal to, to actually think of ecology first instead of economy. So who wants to jump in there? Anybody? No? I can throw in a comment. Um, I, I find it very challenging. That's an incredibly challenging question because there's uh, definitely a relationship between ecology and an economy in the sense that uh, there is a cost to, to everything when it comes to the ecosystem and biology. Trying to separate the two uh, is only functional if Mother Nature had a bank account. <laughs> um, but, the way but, things seem to function at this pace is, is to do any repair or mitigate any damage to environments and ecosystems, it has a cost to it. 
that isn't being uh, generated from anywhere. But what, isn't what the ultimate revenue, cost losing our planet? I'm just just throwing that out there. Oh, absolutely. And whenever I hear someone throw the argument, well, how can we do anything about climate change? It would cost too much. My response is always, well, the cost of not doing something is much greater, the cost of lives. But our society doesn't necessarily balance that or, or factor that cost in. It, it doesn't show up on a balance sheet. That's why I want to put ecology above economy. And really, if you if you look at things like have you modern mon monetary theory and all that is is it's like numbers money is just made up anyway and and they certainly have enough money for war so why can't they have enough money to do what we need to do to save the planet and and in the meantime they're doing things like i know will you're really familiar with the endangered species act even though that wasn't a very effective law in the first place they're trying to weaken it even further um, by making economic considerations to decide whether or not a species should be protected or not. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, I think to really to really go to the the root of the problem, uh, our our economy is based off of uh, commodifying living beings, um, turning living beings into uh, dead products that we can sell. So. Um, our current economy turns a living forest into so many feet of board lumber. Um, they, it turns living rivers into uh, so many um, acre square feet of, of liquid. Um, and if, if you have an economy that's based on that, um, and it's also based off of the need for infinite growth, which, which capitalism requires, uh, it, it shouldn't take us too long to figure out that um, when you have infinite growth on a finite planet, um, it's only a matter of time before th for things really, you, you know, before we hit a wall. Um, and, and yeah, you're right. I, the, the reason that something like, or one of the big reasons why something like the Endangered Species Act uh, will never be very effective is um, it's always, it is always balancing those economic considerations versus um, versus an endangered species. I mean, you know, the, the early 90s, um, the environmental movement or the big question was the whole um, spotted owls versus jobs debate. Um, we can't we can't protect uh, spotted owls because it's going to cost people jobs. Um, but again, we, we know that 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 argument is is bullshit. Um, if, if you don't have a living planet, you can't have a job in the first place. Um, so so that yeah, and right now in utah we're going through the the sage grouse um debacle where they're they're opening up that land you're in utah you know what they're doing with with the opening up their their habitat for mining because it's more economically um feasible to do that and, and their reasoning to, to to discount their endangered species status is because they're in other states but that totally destroys that. I'm sorry that every single environment matters. Every single one they live in matters. It should be considered on a national scale. If every state got to decide, you know, if it was economically feasible and like, oh, the other state's going to deal with it, then there's no state that's going to actually protect them, in yeah. my view. I, I completely agree. They, they won't. Um... You know, and there, there's some part. Part of the problem is, um, you know, there's so many different ways we can take what you just said. But um, um, part of the problem is that human human population has so far exceeded um, the planet's carrying capacity, and there are so many um, billions of humans that um, you know could not could not survive their lives are only possible because of ecocide because of the destruction of of local habitat um and you know i think the truth really is is we're not going to um, see any meaningful protections of of local natural communities local habitats until human population is is 
um, really reduced. And it's just a matter of, of people's lives literally depend on um, exploitation of the natural world right now. Uh, so uh, sooner or later, humanity is going to have to um, start making some tough decisions about um, I mean, it's, it's way too late and then came, we should have been making these decisions a long time ago, but, um, you know, that's going to be at the heart of the problem is, is, is how many human lives are not going to be possible if we're, if we're going to live in a truly sustainable world. Yeah. But it's just really sad that, that the other species aren't being considered at all in this equation. And, and I know, well, you... our... <sighs> go ahead, go ahead, Zen. Sure. That's, that's a very good point. Um, if you ask someone the value of a forest, um, actually David Suzuki said it best when he said um, that until a tree is cut down, it has no value. Uh, and nowadays we're starting to impose things like carbon tax so that the trees have a value. But if I asked, if I gave an example where we have two forests and one contains 12 species and another contains 50 species, is one forest worth more than the other? At this point in time, biodiversity yeah. has no value whatsoever. We don't attribute value to it at all. So there's no real protection for it. The only examples I've seen are when we start designated protected areas of wildlife for tourism, then we can say that a species or two generates revenue. But aside from that, we don't treat wild animals and wild populations or species biodiversity as valuable. And that's a tragedy. And as for population, I do agree. Um, populations are going to crash, human population, and it's going to be by choice or by force, but it is coming. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, do you, what do you think? I yeah. Mean... <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. I, I, you know, one of the, the David Suzuki's um, idea that rings totally true for me. There's a there's another Canadian deep ecologist. Uh, his name was John exactly. Livingston. Um, he he passed away a few years ago, but he he had this idea. He he called it resourcism, and he said uh, as soon as humans name something a resource, then its uh, destruction is only a matter of time. And what we've gotten to the point where the planet is just full of resources. And uh, when we when we look at when we look at trees, uh, you know, those of us here don't see trees as as dollar bills. But um, you know, most people, m the most powerful people in the world right now, see trees and they they see dollar bills. And as long as that remains the case, um, forests are are doomed. Um, and and the rest of the living world is doomed. Um, so yeah, it, it it we have to we are going to have to see the inherent value in in all of life. Um, I think that uh, there is some good news in this, and that is for um, the vast majority of human history, humans lived in cultures where they did see uh, the inherent value in all of life. And you know those cultures weren't perfect, but um, one thing that was that was not on the table was total ecological collapse. Um, so we do have we do have plenty of of a tradition, all of us, all of our traditional cultures, um, uh, of seeing that, and I think that we can reclaim that um, we can reclaim that worldview. Oh, I hope so. I mean, the indigenous indigenous population they they had a thing where they look out for seven generations ahead that they want to preserve our world and we're not living like that right now all we're all the majority of the people in this world right now are living for right now what they can get out of what resources they have available right now and you know how they are in utah uh you live in utah you you see bob bishop and and all those uh, hatch and all that they're they're just trying to scrape every little bit of resources and profit off of it and, and call it okay this is for education you know they're trading federal lands for citra land sit sitla lands you know school trust fund lands and and switching them so that they can get the more valuable lands to profit off of them and then when they have a one billion dollar 
over overshoot in the of the budget of schools do they use it for schools no and that's all profit from all the sitla lands that they transferred from federal lands that were protected lands before this all happened so <laughs> oh yeah we have this money let's use it oh my god are you aware of that situation at all i mean yeah pretty. And it's a really, I mean, it's a brilliant tactic, right? They, yeah. they buy up, they buy up land. And then um, <laughs> if they can exploit the land, then at least some of the money goes into um, the schools, right? So mm -hmm. if you are going to um, oppose them, them doing that, then the easy thing for them to say is, oh, what are you against schools? You know, um, so it's, it it's is a brilliant problem. strategy for them. Yeah. Right. And then they have the surplus. Oh, we have the surplus. We have to spend it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what's going on right now. We have to spend that billion dollar surplus. So we can't spend it on schools. God forbid. <laughs> and it all came from mining. They're, they're destroying the land and water for kids. For kids like really <laughs> well you've mentioned before that if we took the resources uh that are applied to warfare and mm -hmm. applied it to biodiversity loss and climate change literally started a war on on repairing our environment um, right. that, that would be a step in the right direction um, yeah yeah and i was I watching think, a, uh, okay go ahead sorry i won't interrupt. i was gonna say i think until something globally catastrophic occurs uh giving us an excuse or a reason to react people won't because our civilization is not based on preventative measures but on reacting just like the previous civilizations that have arisen on this planet and also collapsed because of poor resource management right don't you think that's happening right now with what what happened in the midwest where we lost two seasons of of grain crops i mean isn't don't you think that should wake people up i mean two seasons of grain crops and we're the breadbasket of the world it, it well in the midwest it's the breadbasket of the world two seasons gone like that and i, and I like to keep happening i like to think of ways that we can change things for the future um and sometimes it's the most trivial little suggestions but if i could do anything in in the court of law the way will would do I, I would somehow make it uh, so that you could not say the word resource without saying the word finite before it. <laughs> um, if yeah. people could just start to realize that all resources are finite, there is a limited amount. And okay, I, Will and Zen, I'm going to let you guys have a little conversation regarding the <laughs> legal issues and, and things you might be able to do to maybe protect the biodiversity. So you guys go at it i'm ex I, i'm excited to watch <laughs> i'm very excited about will's take on on doing something i haven't really seen before which from my understanding is that you're speaking on behalf of the environment you're representing the the rivers and valleys and lakes and and that's a very noble position to come from thank you yeah thank you um um yeah so i i um i guess i should explain some of the the rights of nature stuff is that that the direction i should go in um it's a good start what uh, what rights does nature have like the living organisms in an environment uh until we discover it identify it label it or classify it as endangered does it have any rights no, so currently under American law, uh, nature is only defined as property, um, and property is, <laughs> is, is yeah. First, prop property is it, I'll even say, is a thing, right? Is an object, and uh, under American law, property rights uh, they call them a bundle of rights, and and part of your um, the bundle of rights that come with property ownership, of course, is the is the right to destroy your property. Um, so, so, you know, if you, if you bought, uh, three acres of, of, of prairie lands in the Midwest 150 years ago, you, um, also bought the right to plow it, to strip every living Chop. thing off of it and, and plant grain. Um, and so it's, it's not just that American law is, uh, defining nature as property. American law protects the destruction of property. 
Um, and you, you know, we can pick any sort of um, confrontational environmental cause, um, you know, the stuff at Standing Rock, um, we have to remember that the, the National Guard and the corporations that, that destroyed Standing Rock um, were legally protected. They, they were in the legal right uh, to do that. Um, I'm not saying that they were right. I'm saying that American law protected their right to uh, enforce that. So the work that I do um, with, with rights of nature uh, is to try and um, undermine this conception of nature as property in American law, try to redefine uh, nature at, as a living being with, um, with a right to exist, to flourish, to naturally evolve. Um, and, you know, there, there's sort of on one level, there is the push to actually, uh, it would be a much better world to live in if, if major natural communities like um, the Colorado River had rights, or recently um, the city of Toledo just voted to um, uh, endow Lake Erie with rights. Um, so we would live in a better world if that was happening. But I think more importantly, um, rights of nature in this work shows people, it, 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 it kind of pulls the curtain back and shows people how law protects uh, ecocide. Um, and there's all kinds of conclusions people can draw from that. You know, when you, when you step into a courtroom, you're trying to ask a judge to do the right thing. You're trying to ask the judge to um, <laughs> recognize rights for nature. Um, and that doesn't work, does it? Because the Constitution doesn't protect nature. Um, okay, can I just quote you from, from <laughs> an interview? Could I? Sure. sure. <laughs> Okay, I love this quote, and this is the whole reason I went. I had to bring you on. It's, well, not the whole reason. This is your whole interview, but this is like the most amazing quote. So, Will says, "What nature creates is far superior to what humans create," and I just think that is so just insightful and so correct. It is so true. Like there's an entire field of science based on that biomimicry. Uh, looking at nature for ideas and innovations and duplicating it because nature has spent far more time solving problems than we have. Oh yeah, it's taken generation after generation after generation of evolution, and and now our climate's changing way too fast for for people and animals and and plants to to evolve. So we're kind of screwed. But I really just would really like to hold on to as much as we can while we can what do y'all think is the best solution and and by the way everyone watch we got quite a group here by the way live um last i looked we have 27 people here live which is pretty cool 30 cool all right awesome we're gonna give some shout outs and and read some comments so hold off on the comments you want read um, I'll let you know a couple minutes before, but yeah, I mean, we have a great, a great audience here and I appreciate y'all. Now I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> that happens. It's just... It sounds like Will was saying, um, we need to drastically and radically change a whole bunch of laws. Um, mm -hmm. if we want to make a step forward, we'd have to change uh, the constitution to include ecology and and other living species because there is a great deal of of um speciesism how do you see that or humanism it's kind of like a racist thing where humans think they're superior to all other beings on the planet when we act absolutely what would you call it yeah that and putting ourselves at the center. Now, I know this might be a, a difficult thing to bring up considering our topic, but I hate to say that, is it possible that religion is a little bit of a challenge as well? Only because some religious views suggest that man have, has dominion over all, all life, that we are at the center of everything. It raises the question of, does That's that not out of line at all in my book. I brought that up several times, yes. Especially living in this state, you see that, um, I mean, maybe not just this state, but maybe some places in the South as well. 
people believe there that everything on this planet was put there for their use and abuse. So, you know, it doesn't matter if they destroy the world around them. It, you know, God's going to show up and, and, and save them in the end. And to me, that's really sad. And I think religion has really played a huge part in destroying this planet. And I don't mean to say that against any religious people. I mean, there's really great people I know that are Mormons and everything, but I'm sorry, but that whole belief is destructive. It's very destructive to our planet and, well, and I, I, to our life. I like to think um, that the, instead of thinking that the world is theirs to destroy in any way they see fit, um, that instead like the world has been given to be maintained. So you can still have yeah. your religious beliefs and want to affect positive change in the world. And um, there but, are religious people who believe that, that believe it's a responsibility, not just something for them to use. And I respect that. Like the Native Americans feel that way. But, um, and there are a few religious people that feel that way as well. And those those type, I totally respect, yes. But not the ones that think- the only reason I brought it up is because I feel that, um, religion and the law even though they have been separating themselves over time are still interlinked so you almost have to address both at the same time but maybe will could, could clarify yeah yeah what that do you have to say that. will <laughs> <laughs> um absolutely i think uh i think that their religion is is at the heart of the matter and 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 to take it even deeper than than religion, maybe spirituality, like um, to me, the the problem, one of the problems is human behavior. Uh, human beings are destroying the planet. Um, some of us are more culpable than others, of course. Some of them are more culpable than others. Um, but uh, they're... Again, if you go far enough back in human history, all of our all of our ancestry lived in traditional cultures um, that that viewed all of the living world as sacred. And when you when you have a culture that generation after generation teaches that to people, and they teach people to um, um, to relate to the world in that way, and and you get your spiritual fulfillment from that worldview, uh, then then you're going to change that your whole culture is going to behave differently and right now when when most people um you know most people believe in this abstract sky god that's somehow removed from the planet and the whole goal of life is to um, follow your religion's tenets so that you can go to heaven you can leave this natural world um i think it's like you said it's inevitable that that the a uh, living world is going to turn into a resource, is going to turn into a, a dead um, product that you can use however you see fit because you're only here for a short time. Um, and, and the whole goal of your life is to, to go to this paradise that is somewhere else. Um, so yeah, I think that religion is at the heart of the problem. And, and that's really interesting that you connected religion and law because um, we live in, in what's called an English common law system. American law um, traces its roots all the way back to medieval um, England. Well, medieval England, English law was rooted in both um, church law, the, the law of the Catholic Church, and um, they, they sort of developed this imperial law alongside of it. But you, would either, you had to choose back then to go into ecclesi ecclesiastical church or courts, church courts, or you go into uh, courts of equity, um, property courts. Um, so the, this, it, it goes very back to the very beginnings of, of American culture, um, religion and law were tied hand in hand. Um, so absolutely. You don't swear on a Bible to be signed into a court. So there's still a relationship there. Oh, there's absolutely a relationship there. And as well as the, the, the whole idea that man was was created in god's image so so there people are are taught to worship you know the god that's in man's image like god you know like people and yet if if we were to worship the planet and nature in instead that would be 
that would change everything is what I'm trying to say. That would change everything. If, if we were taught to worship, you know, the food and the, the, the plants and the animals, we would take better care of them in, instead of just using them for money. Money is more important than the I land perhaps, and the water and the air at this point. If people valued and, and, and worshipped and treated as sacred the environment that sustains us, mm -hmm. then it would make it much easier to change the laws to suit that. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we almost have to tackle both at the same time. And it's a very difficult conversation to have. And it, yeah, it, but we need to have it. And I'm really happy that we're having it here. Um, it's very important to have. I mean, money doesn't matter a damn if you don't have a place to live, if you don't have food to eat, if you don't have air to breathe. It doesn't matter at all. So we need to change our way of thinking and start worshiping nature instead of some fictitious being in the sky that, that does not sustain us nature sustains us that is our god you know it's i talked to i had an interview with guy lane and he did a really he has this really weird thing he's doing like he, he's trying to turn religious religion around and making it to where it worships the planet instead of uh instead of a superior human being and i think that's a great idea i mean this is it's kind of out of fun but at the same time it's just trying to change people's way of thinking and i really like that idea i think we would be in a lot better I like place it, for sure. I'm, nervous. I'm nervous about the conflict religious wars have been prevalent on our planet for a very long mm -hmm. time i think the safest course of action would be if we could steer people to seeing the environment and the earth as a representation of whatever god you believe in if, if you right. can believe a little piece of bread is the body of Christ, then what is the planet that we all live on? Um, I know. If people could contribute spirituality to that, um, maybe we could capitalize on, on that. Um, but I, I, I do not know how to have that conversation. And I'm, I'm more, again, interested in asking Will some more questions about Okay, I'll let you ask right? more questions. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will let you go ahead. I was gonna say something else, but I'll, I'll just let Sorry you. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> no, you're good. Will, what I've noticed, what I've noticed that's been happening, Will, is that the the ability to uh, grow your own food on your own lawn um, and then sell those products has been systematically attacked by. Uh, groups like the FDA saying that if you can't send in enough a, a, a product to be tested, then it's an unsafe product, even though humans have been doing this for thousands of years, as well as uh, putting like rain barrels on your property. Um, I'm now starting to see in some communities, some new bylaws being enforced where you're essentially taking water from the system and you need to file permits in advance because they're trying to monetize um, the resource of water on your land and trying to, to limit your ability to have like a mom and pop vegetable garden in your own property. And, and this seems like we're making steps in the wrong direction. Um, do you have any information you could give me as to why this is? Is this all entirely based on profit? Yeah, I think that people, <laughs> people much smarter than me have, have, um, you noticed that or recognized a pattern within capitalism and capitalism always works to take to take something that um, you can access for free uh, so so if you if you access clean water from a river or you you get your food from from hunting and gathering uh, it's something that um, is free. Capitalism will always work to commodify that, to take something that was free and sell it back to you. And if it can, if it can commodify something that is essential to life, like food, um, then it can control you, you know? So, um, if, if you look at the history of, of capitalism, say, um, one of the, one of the really birthplaces of what we consider modern capitalism, again, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, um, 
as as capitalism started to grow through the late 1700s and early 1800s one of the big things that they needed to do was they needed to restrict poor people's access to the land because poor people could feed themselves you know with with um, as shepherds or or um, other things and they they needed to to privatize the land so they needed to restrict people's access to the land so that they had to go to work in the factories to afford the food that they would buy from capitalists again. Um, and this is a pattern that's still going on today. I mean, this is this is um, one of the reasons why um, there's so much violence happening down in, in uh, South America right now. You have, you have people that um, um, have lived off the land for thousands and thousands of years. Um, you need to go in and you need to control those people so that you can sell them stuff because they don't need to buy anything from you right now when when they have an intact rainforest supporting them. Um, so that that's a um, by by doing things like restricting people from from um, collecting rainwater, uh, there you're controlling people. You're trying to make people buy your stuff, um, and and that's a that is one of the old, oldest plays in the capitalist playbook. Is, is there anything we can do about it? <laughs> well, yes, the, the um, you know, this is, you're not going to hear this from a lot of other lawyers, but um, I was, I'm an animal before I'm a, I'm a lawyer. And um, the, the truth is that law is based on violence. The only way that um, judges can order you to do something um, well, I mean, you can comply with their orders, but at the end of the day, they have police and soldiers and guns to tell you what to do. Um, and, you know, I think we've seen that our legal system is, is uh, it was designed to, to encourage ecocide. Um, and I'm of the opinion that we're only going to be able to change that, that legal system when we're able to exert the same kind of force. You know, we're, um, they, the cops have guns. Sooner or later, our communities are going to have to uh, think about armed self-defense as well. What yeah, you're that's saying? Where, that's that's where, where I. Sorry, go ahead. Army. I I agree. I get it. Uh, what you're saying is that planet Earth needs its own army. Absolutely. Yes. And the that's why I differ from most progressives. Of- I I I believe in the Second Amendment because that's what was put in place for. Um, exactly what's going on right now. Um, yeah, I'm probably going to get all kinds of crap for that, but I am a gun owner and we can, we can talk about the second amendment too, if you want. (laughs) We could get anywhere you want to go. This is my channel. (laughs) Well, most people don't, a lot of people don't realize that the, some of the earliest gun control laws were in the South after the civil war and freed slaves had armed themselves um and there were a lot of nervous slave owners ex-slave owners and ex-confederate soldiers that looked around and said that's not a good idea if if we have a majority population that um has access to guns then they can take power um and and so some of the very first gun control laws were in the south um for that very reason and you know People don't. People often associate people like Martin Luther King Jr. as as a strict pacifist. Martin Luther King Jr. His house was described as an arsenal. He owned a lot of guns, um, and the people that he surrounded himself with had to be armed. Um, I mean, he was assassinated. He knew how how um, in jeopardy his life was, and um, while he often espoused nonviolence as a tactic. Um, he had guns. So I, I, for your progressive audience out there, um, I think we really need to think about um, training ourselves and um, learning how to use those guns because when when shit really hits the fan, they're not going to be afraid to use the guns on us. No, they won't. Um, Most apocalyptic. Okay, <laughs> took a dark turn there. <laughs> I know, we kind of did. I'm sorry to all my progressive viewers. It's just... Oh, no, no. It's, it's just really... It's, it's, it, it, when you live in the country, you have a different viewpoint for one, and you kind of want to protect your stuff. <laughs> it's like, ah, I and, do agree and I, though. Um, 
we're, we're in a war and we're tr the three of us and the people that are viewing this we're we really are the first defenders of our environment the, mm -hmm. the ones who are talking about it as activists not that i'm endorsing or suggesting any crazy aggressive Me behavior Me but I, I'm I'm, i am starting to get a clear vision of what you're saying that the corporations and the law which are enforced by police and military so they are armed uh are systematically for control purposes wiping out the environment that sustains us and the only chance that that environment has of surviving is to defend itself most likely armed yeah and I, yeah it's um that's scary <laughs> I, well yeah it's scary it's also you know there's a there's a time element to this too i think people we there's enough of us uh that if we got smart that we could end this party tomorrow um and in my mind that creates a moral dilemma because um if, if you compared this every day that that civilization continues every day that business as usual continues um you know we know dozens of species are going extinct every day um, we know that the land's um, carrying capacity permanent carrying capacity is being drawn down um, every day longer that this goes on the less there is for those for us right now but the people that come after us um, and if you have the power to stop it at some point aren't you morally culpable aren't you morally wrong obligated you're obligated, obligated to take up whatever whatever tools you have to stop it um that that's something and that just I, for our viewers when i say arming yourself that can include um helping those with resources or funds or mm -hmm. support in any way uh people such as will who are on the front lines in yes. in the legal courts trying to represent the environment um that that can be the way that you contribute as well it doesn't yeah. necessarily I mean, just give a dollar to people who are fighting this fight. Just a dollar, you know, if you have a lot of people doing that, help them out. It's important, you know? So if you have a Patreon or something like that, shout it out. If you have some, you know, go find me, do it now. <laughs> I, I do have a Patreon, but I would, I want to be clear that, um, you know, there are people that are on, you know, real front lines, like the court, you know, I'm not, my life is not endangered on day to day thing, but you know, there are people, um, I mean, Standing Rock was a great example there. Again, there were, you know, indigenous peoples that were standing in front of, of guns to protect their homelands. You know, it was a scene out of 1840 uh, America, you know, those were the uh, true heroes. I watched that live streaming almost the whole entire time. I couldn't take my eyes off it. I was, yeah, I was, I was, I was there with them in my mind. Maybe two or three billion more people and we're there so mm -hmm. right track. Yeah. how do we recruit uh, more people that's like this we just keep talking and getting more people to understand what's going on that's that's so my to those opinion. of you watching go get your friends go get your neighbors get your family bring them to come and watch this stream because <laughs> nothing is going to change unless we collectively reach out to everyone we know and and increase awareness education mm -hmm. and funneling resources towards people that have an opportunity to to have an impact yes i mean i i i can't do anything but try and get the word out and that's what i'm trying to do but locating people like will and like you zen who who you know you're researching will is an attorney these are people that can really help out our causes and and try to you know help in some way to extend life on our planet even if it's for maybe another couple of years it's worth fighting for and that's the way I've, i know there's a lot of people that say you know it's done it's like why are you still fighting because i have kids and and i have horses and i have dogs oh, and there's nature out there that i'd like to enjoy for a couple more years thank you um yeah there's reason to fight still there really is there's um you know they there was um at the end of world war ii there was a plot within the the nazi 
higher ups, there were several, uh, more than several, a network of people that were trying to assassinate Hitler and try to bring the war to an end um, much, much more quickly. And the people, um, this was kind of like uh, at the end of 1944, early 1945, the, the writing was on the wall, the war was going to end. Um, and uh, these, these um, people within the Nazi party that are trying to bring it down, they were asked afterwards, you know, how, why, why were you still plotting to kill Hitler when um, you knew that the war was over? Why did you endanger yourself when you knew it was going to come down? And they said because they wanted the world to know that there were, in fact, good German people. Um, and and they, they wanted to send that message to the world. And I think that's the situation that we're in. We need to show, you know, I don't have any kids, but I have a six-year-old niece and a three-year-old nephew. And when he's, when my three-year-old nephew is, is my age, I want him to look me in the eye and know that I tried to do something. And yeah. I don't want him to, you know, live in this, you know, he's got to wear an oxygen mask or something and say, Uncle Will, you know, why the hell didn't you stop this? Yeah, um, what did you do to try to stop yeah. we need We need more insiders, like, mm -hmm. like there was in 1944. So again, to those who are watching this, if you work for an oil company, if you work for a gas mining company, a resource mining company, and there are some files that they wouldn't want to get out, have you heard of WikiLeaks? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Feel free to put that information in. They're uh, after there Julian, though. They're after Julian. Damn it. No, but uh, no, it's true. But evidence. also, the, the people that yeah. fought the hardest. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Ben. No, no, um, go ahead. But the the ones in in the in the concentration camps the ones that fought tended to survive longer than the ones that just gave in and and that's really important to know so we all need to be fighters you know the people that care we need to be the fighters and we need to to be the resilient ones that that last as long as we can and fight for every last drop every last drop of of nature that we can we need to fight for every bit as long as we can and for the kids for my kids i have two grandkids now by marriage and i'll fight for them i'll fight for them till my last breath and that's why i'm still fighting that i'm not giving up so that's all i have to say <laughs> sorry go ahead guys um. <laughs> <laughs> now what do you say do you want to go to comments um yeah we can do that um I don't know if Oz wants to read them or if you want me to, you guys. Okay, go ahead. Sure, yeah, of course. Make your comments, guys, now. We're going to go through them. As soon as Oz finds the one he's looking for. I'll, I'll read humans while you're looking. Oh, they can't? OK. Oh, great. OK. Humans is act as as if we are winning, use an attitude of success with positive forward looking position. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I, I don't have the greatest positive attitude, but still I'm gonna fight till the end. And that's what I owe my kids. That's what I owe the planet. And that's just the way I look at it. Thank you, human. There's a reason why you're my wrench. Um, okay, for some reason, Gazar Gazar had his message redacted. I don't know why. Um, uh, honest media is like hoping for non-polluting cars. <laughs> True, even the electric cars, there's, yeah, we don't know what to do with the batteries yet. And, you know, they did the cash for clunkers and they melt down a perfectly good car for to build an electric car and there's all that energy that goes into that. That's an issue. Um, oh, there's Torstein. I noticed a lot of people are mentioning Artificial intelligence as a potential future technology that may come to the rescue. Um, I like well, to keep that one as a, a back of my back pocket safety net. 
if we do happen to develop AI at some point in the future, and we do convince it that having a symbiotic relationship with us is in both of our best interests. Do you know what my biggest out. fear? Okay, I'm going to say my biggest fear about AI is that AI will decide that we're screwing over everything and will want to kill us all. <laughs> and I wouldn't blame it. <laughs> That's my biggest fear about AI. It's like, okay, humans suck. Let's just get rid of them. <laughs> That's, oh, I know that's terrible. Okay, where are we? Um, I wrote that. Okay, going south, I had no say in choosing my race. Wait, something right. Torstein, you're talking to someone else. Um, Valea, five, six. I don't mind dying, but FEMA camp is out of the question. Uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't want to be in a FEMA camp either. Sandy, I'm too sore to fight. Damn it, Sandy, you can fight. You're still fighting. Don't give me that crap. Um, that's environmental coffee house, Sandy. Um, okay, Kim and I got it. No audio on, on Oz, so he's not going to talk anymore. We'll just leave him out till he gets that figured out. <laughs> At least we're, we're, we're working through all these issues. Eventually, we'll get it set. Going south, many of my best friends are also racist like you. Okay. Many of my family are racist so okay i know you're talking to someone else i don't care and just whatever um i don't question, i don't yeah. think race applies at all to this unless we're talking about the survival of the human race yeah well but, yes and was the amph amph more i don't know what's the racist with humans being like superior to all beings what's that speciesism Something like that. Uh, I don't know. Humanism. Different words. Homo uh, sapienism. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> the the Derek Jensen, the the environmental writer, he he's using a term human supremacism. He he wrote yeah, about that. the myth of human supremacy, and he one of the brilliant things he did was compared that to white supremacy and how um, the logic works the same way. Like, you know, it's. Um, white supremacy works to uh, objectify and um, um, extract resources from people of color, and human supremacy works to objectify and extract resources from non-humans. Yeah, you know, it makes total sense. I, 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 mean, I think that's why I really yeah, like Derek Jensen. About, Go ahead. The funny thing about the word supremacy here is that uh, supremacy implies that we are at the top. Now, if that was a pyramid and we were at the top of it, it would be wonderful. But what we're in is an ecosystem where populations go up and then come back down. So mm -hmm. being at the tippy top is not actually a good thing because we are headed yeah. down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Bella, five, six, question AI. Yes, I will question AI. Uh, Jay Thadcast, what is the fight environment for people? Oh, what environment for people? No, not for me. I mean, some people are fighting for the environment just to save people. I'm fighting for the environment to save life on this planet, not just human life. Yeah, it'd be nice if I saved my kids for a little longer, but even more importantly, saving life altogether. Uh, that's kind right. of there are bigger three, than me. Three or four massive upcoming challenges, and those are not including, you know, solar flares or meteors or volcanoes or earthquakes, which are all viable threats as well. Yeah, um, earthquakes have been looming, happening here in Utah recently, <laughs> a lot. The looming catastrophes that are involved with biodiversity loss and climate change are dealing with it might lead to an economic collapse. Dealing with it or not dealing with it might lead to a um, civilization collapse. Um, not dealing with it might lead to human supporting ecosystem collapse. And worst case scenario is complete destabilization and collapse of the ecosystem to be able to support any life at all, mm -hmm. which is, I believe, still on the table. Um, yeah. So we have a lot of bottlenecks to go through uh, in a very short time, on top of all the other outside potential things like rise of AI machines and such, viral outbreaks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's, it's, it's kind of there's a terrifying a time. It's surprising yeah. that our society is not thinking of redundancy, preventative measures, backup plans, 
um, you know, giant floating arcs on the ocean and in the ocean and in space. Like we're, we're barely scratching the surface of planning for a future that in my eyes is absolutely inevitable and post-apocalyptic. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, but there doesn't matter if you find a place to actually live and survive for the moment. If, if all of the environment dies around us, we'll have nothing to eat. And so does that yeah. really matter? I mean, not really. Buy us weeks, maybe months for the super rich with their own floaty islands. They might acquire yeah. months, just, but it, again, but, that's. I, I mean, you know, there's the methane bomb. There's, uh, there's the biosphere. The you know the coextinction. Back, yeah. How many are yeah. we at? Twenty twenty seven biological and ecosystem feedback loops that have started in their yeah. neg negative spiral. And I would argue there's more than that because when when we have to rebuild all the infrastructure that's being destroyed by my interconnection sucks, but all the the rebuilding of the infrastructure is going to cause more damage to the atmosphere because of more more mining and more um, and in itself is going to. for nature to do that so is everybody frozen too or is it just me just <laughs> okay okay i think i was so are you still okay. there okay I'm gonna go through the, con I'm here. It's Will still here. I'm the one that went. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me yep. now? Okay, I'm gonna go through these comments because we're, we're going on pretty late, but dang, we have 43 people on with us right now. That's pretty Excellent. awesome. thank you for joining us. <laughs> yeah, thank you both. You're great guests. Okay, um, let's see, where was I? Eshiva, they are saying now that if polluting is stopped, the skies will clear up and then rays from sun will get through the atmosphere too much and start making, yeah, it's called the um, stratospheric aerosol, aerosol effect. Yeah, yeah, or the dimming, um, global yeah. dimming. Yeah, I mean, so the best hope we have, have is to slowly problem. get off of fossil fuels and try to, to rebuild our biosphere to just extend their life a little bit longer yeah essentially if we're going to phase out carbon dioxide emissions at the exact same time and a perfect balance we also have to supplement with stratospheric aerosol injection to offset the decrease in in cloud cover otherwise we're going to be facing another uh feedback loop another mechanism that's a driving force for heat on the planet so uh, just saying let's cut down on CO2 alone is not a problem. We also have to use competitive inhibition and inhibit with some other cloud formation that we artificially create. So even just decreasing CO2 on its own is nowhere near enough. We're, we have a very complex system that is very delicate to tinker with. No and we kidding. have to manage hundreds, if not thousands of components at once. I hope we develop AI rapidly because we would need its help. Okay, really quick before my internet dies, Oz, you have to go through the comments because my internet is dying, my phone is dying, I can't read the comments. So could you please read through the comments for me, if you can still hear me? Can you guys hear Oz? Okay, look at the comments. Make sure that they can hear you. My phone is dead and my internet is sucking right now. And I can't, so I can't put my hotspot for my phone on. So we've got to wrap this up um, pretty quick here. Okay, I think they can now. I wish I could see, but my phone is dead, so. Someone said, 
uh, the best way to teach is by yeah, example. Um, I'd have to agree. I'd have to yeah, agree with that. Yeah, go ahead. So, you guys want to read those comments, yeah. but find yeah. out what Osama meant by I had a sex change. What? <laughs> what did that mean? Uh, I, I think, and I try as much as possible to get other people to get excited about life. Um, I give out aquariums. Um, I try to get people more interested in learning about the nitrification cycle, um, understanding homeostatic ecosystems, how they work, how they function, how the more complex they are, the more stable they are. Um, I try to teach people about the risks of monocultures, how it decreases the adaptability to environmental changes. People um, really need to know about the monoculture oh, right. and factory farming. You can't pound that into people's heads enough. You really can't. Yes. Yeah, let's do. Um, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Leave your comments on the video, and I will maybe try and do a video answering those comments. So maybe with these two guys again, because they're awesome if they both want to come back. This is like the Anytime. biggest audience I've had ever. So please <laughs> <laughs> come back. <Cool. laughs> Yeah, um, go for it, Will. Your last pitch and, and your book. You don't you have a book in October oh, that's coming out? Yeah, I have I have a book uh, called How Dams Fall uh, that's coming out through um, Homebound Publications imprint Little Bound Books. That'll be in October. You can follow my work at willfalk.org, W-I-L-L-F-A-L-K dot O-R-G. Um, and my, I guess my final comments are, um, we fight back, fight back however you can. Uh, we're only talking about the only home that we have. And um, every second that passes, more and more of that home disappears. So fight back however you can. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Will. And thank you, Zen. Seriously, I do want you guys back. But um, we are having a little mini collapse here and all my stuff is going down. So we forgot to end it for tonight. Uh, if you two just hang on one second and I'm just going to say goodbye to you all. And if you have it in your heart to help me on Patreon, I'm probably going to lose my job for what I'm doing here. And I need better internet. Um, really need better internet. All I need is a dollar a month from like 50 people and I'll get my internet so anyway you guys yeah see i'm freezing and it looks like crap when i freeze so anyway you guys all have a good night and i will see you sunday when i'm interviewing my daughter and maybe i'll invite either or i will invite will or jason zen to come back um on sunday if they would like to join me for that conversation that oh. one, but I, I i might sit out but i definitely want to see uh how a parent would tell their children uh, a child about the state of the environment uh, i'm it's, it's going to be very delicate it's yeah i'm probably not going to be as blunt but she's watching this probably so ariel hi yeah um <laughs> so uh we'll see what happens but you guys you go guys have a very good night and we will see you on sunday and talk to you soon bye guys I think that went.